A critical challenge in medicine is connecting patients to the right experts. In China, for example, there's only one pathologist to every 70,000 people. That is why hospitals are turning to artificial intelligence to compensate for the demand for doctors. In Beijing, researchers are using deep learning algorithms to detect the disease. New research suggests that a computer algorithm may be better than radiologists at detecting cancer, and early detection has reduced cancer deaths by 20%. For Tony and Sabelle, cancer has always been at the center of their careers and their relationship. So I had the good fortune of finding out about you from your husband. He says you're persuasive, uh, intelligent, sweet, edgy. Um, so we know why the two of you are together. Obviously, this is romance. But there's a third party to this relationship, which is cancer, which the two of you were working on beforehand, and then cancer entered your life. So how has that changed things, would you say, for the two of you? Well, it is fate, right? We both went into uh, medicine to become cancer doctors. Uh, we wanted to cure cancer, which most people don't want to talk about these days because it's, it's a cliche. But we truly and honestly uh, thought that that was our goal and vision in life. So when we met, this was very natural for us to uh, get drawn to each other, both romantically, but around cancer. In fact, our first date, he brought me a bunch of papers to discuss stem cell plasticity on transplant patients. That that's was our that's first pretty date. romantic, isn't it? <laughs> Spent two hours and I was like, okay, great. Good to talk about papers and research, but let's talk about when we're going to get together again. <laughs> so, but um, who needs is, wine and flowers, right? It's that's like, right. Wow, but but so then when when he's diagnosed, did that change things in a way? I mean, well, you it, wouldn't have what you have going now and, and trying to help all these other patients if if he had been diagnosed in a sense. Well, if right? it well if it hasn't. Uh, 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 if it hasn't done anything, it made us even more persistent and eager to cure cancer. And, and when I say we sometimes disagree on that, he says, you know, I may not be cured of this disease, but I will live with this disease chronically as long as I can, and I'm going to uh, try to reach to that goal of cure. And I believe, well, you went through all these treatments, and I really believe you're cured, but okay, let's forget about curing cancer. It's about helping the patients to get to get to that goal, living normal and normal lives with a chronic disease, which is cancerous. And so if it, if it, it, it matured, I think, both of us on how to approach cancer patients. I used to, I thought I was a very empathic, empathic doctor listening to my patients and feeling uh, what they feel and being in their shoes. But after his diagnosis, I stopped in the middle of the sentence and I watched the patient's body language and I say, Wait, okay, let's talk. Let me just listen to you. What do you think? And because being in that shoes, now I understand what they go through their minds. It's a very scary situation. And everybody wants to get, you know, I want to live. Everybody has their goals in life and reaching that uh, uh, steps uh, in um, what they want to do, graduating, seeing the um, child's graduation from high school or a granddaughter's graduation from college, those kind of steps are important. But at the end of the day, what matters to patients and people is, is the hope. Hope that you are going to survive, you're going to live a normal life, you're going to have some control over your life. Because when cancer happens, you lose a lot of control, which happened to us too. So I think answering your question in a shorter way, yeah, it changed us to a degree that I think it was very helpful, more deep understanding of patients, what they go through. Would you agree, Tony? Yeah, one thing that I would say is, for a long time, Sibel uh, would talk about this idea of, are you cured, are you cured? You know, I think you're cured. Uh, and uh, and I want to live, you know, to you know, uh, into our 90s. We want to live to be, you know, old together. And we had a conversation that I'm sure she'll remember, 
where, uh, you know, I was saying, you know, gosh, I hope that's the case myself. But, uh, you know, what really matters is just enjoying our lives now. What we, what we have control of absolutely right now is what happens today and how we, how we live together and enjoying every moment that we have and, and making that, you know, recognizing how precious that is to us. Because who knows what's going to happen to any of us tomorrow. Uh, and, and I think that was a conversation that I certainly yes. remember yes. that has that kind of changed our mindsets. And, and you know what I used to think about being a survivor was you lived for 10 years, and you, uh, uh, the disease has not returned and you're a survivor. I think the survivor is the moment that you get diagnosed and you get into this journey and you're trying to live your life as normal as you can. You might die in two months, you might die 25 years from now. We don't know. Today, largely due to chemotherapy and treatments like stem cell transplants, cancer survival rates have risen globally, although they vary depending on how developed the country is. New drugs are constantly entering the market too, with two dozen new cancer drugs approved in the United States in 2018 alone. But with so many options, finding the right treatment path can be confusing. Tony's own cancer diagnosis motivated him to create All for Cure, an online platform for patients, clinicians, and researchers to share information about cancer treatments. Are you changing the face of medicine in a sense? I mean, yes. I know. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to give you a grandiose title, but it's true, isn't it? Sure, sure. So how do you see medicine in the future? I mean, this is... This is going to be a step in a whole new direction, isn't it? Yeah, what I would say is, uh, you know, th th some really core aspects of this are we're, we're, you know, deeply aligned with the very, you know, working to try to achieve the very best uh, outcome that's possible for our patients. But at the same time, we, you know, if things work as well as they possibly can, we, we need to have the clinician engaged in the platform as well. So when my wife, Sabel, is seeing a patient in, with myeloma, she logs into All for Cure, she sees the patient's dashboard, she's you know, asking a question, she wants to you know, ping this expert at, at Harvard or this expert in Seattle. Uh, you know, that, that ecosystem surrounding a clinical decision for a patient is, help, again, helpful to the patient but the patient's participation is helping us all get better. So I think the idea of the patient not just being the recipient of all of this effort, but actually being willing to contribute their own information and their own experience to the improvement for everyone, for future generations, is, is a profoundly important aspect of what we're doing. Let me talk to you about data because you talked about it and, and you said, uh, you know, this could be valuable to the pharmaceutical companies and everybody has the black hats and the white hats in the society we live in and there's this concern, I've got to protect my data, I've got to embrace my data, I've got to keep the data close to me, I can't let anybody have it and this might be the wrong group to have it. What about the concerns about personal information, data sharing, all of that? Because I'm sure, uh, you know, you've thought about it, it's, it's a concern for so many people. No, it is. It's a. It's. And I think it's a very valid concern. Uh, you know, when you look now at all of the social, you know, how how information's been used in social media uh, to do things that you know you may never have uh, been aware of uh, that come back to influence you in ways that you were never aware of. I think one thing that's important to understand is that there are already many companies that use patient medical data uh, and put it together and assemble it and sell it to pharmaceutical companies. So when you get a prescription filled, when you go to see your doctor and, you, and, and any number of things happen, that data is already being captured and sold without your knowledge. Now, it doesn't have your name on it. It's de-identified, but, but that, that's been going on for many years. <clears throat> So here, in, with All for Cure, we, we recognize the importance of our stewardship over the information that the, our patients uh, share with us. We, are, we, we have asked our patients to share all of their medical records 
because it gives us the best possible view of what's going on with them so that when we make a suggestion, it's informed by what's actually going on in the patient rather than you know, trying to work in, you know, in, in, in areas where there's, there are question marks. So we're trying to remove as many of those question marks as, as, uh, as possible by just having a comprehensive view of what's happened to the patient. Uh, but there is. You know, for our patients, you know, we, you know and, and we have, you know, the data behind a firewall. It's extremely well protected. But if Target can get, you know, hacked for credit card numbers, you know, we can do everything that we can to protect that information. But, uh, but I can't, you know, I can't tell someone that it's impossible that, that, uh, that you know, the data could never be... Uh, uh, hacked by, by an outside entity. I think what we're trying to do is enter into a partnership with patients where we are we're doing everything that, we're, that we possibly can do to use the information that you give us to provide benefit to you and to benefit society as a whole and to fire and, and to protect it as well as, as can possibly be protected from nefarious outside influences. We can thank clinical trials for successful treatments in use today. But these trials can be expensive, time and labor consuming, and it's often difficult to recruit patients. You know, people complain that fewer than 5% of cancer patients participate in clinical trials. Now, how could that be? It's not like cancer is solved and we don't need clinical trials. We desperately need more clinical trials to develop better treatments, yet fewer than 5% of patients participate. And the reason that, that that's the case, I believe, is that our clinical trial system sucks. Uh, we have, if I'm a patient with cancer and I want to participate in a clinical trial, uh, I have to go find the clinical trial. And, uh, and that might require that I drive, you know, a long way. If the clinical trial is not available in my home, in my town, uh, then I might have to go to some, somewhere else around the country to, to get on that trial. So which clinical trial should I pick? Should I just pick the one that happens to be closest to me? Or should I try to survey the landscape of clinical trials and find the one that seems best for me? Uh, and right now, the system's set up so that, you know, most patients end up on clinical trials that just happen to be in their neighborhood. So getting back to all for cure imagine that you have, uh, you have a drug that's already, a, uh, you're a pharmaceutical company, you have a drug that's already FDA approved in one specific part of treating my, multiple myeloma. Now let's imagine that you want to get it approved in other patients with myeloma outside this subset. Well, your drug's FDA approved, so any oncologist in the country can write a prescription for that drug. So with All for Cure, what, what we enable is that if I want to participate in a clinical trial, I can just go see my doctor. My doctor can write a prescription uh, that, that would allow me to enter this clinical trial just by going to see my doctor. And now All for Cure can capture the information into a database that can then be submitted to the FDA for approval. And now, if we get enough of those patients, we can, you know, now that drug gets approved in that setting as well. So, the clinic, so instead of requiring that the, that the patient travel to the clinical trial, you're bringing the clinical trial to the patient. That's, that's where we're headed. You also mentioned, I think in your TED talk, that you have clinical trials and then you have the patient and you have this firewall in between. Yeah. And this is really kind of knocking it down, isn't right, it? Right, right. And Absolutely. that's important. That's super important. It's super important. I think, I think patients don't realize how important they are as partners in this whole you know, drive to cure cancer. They're not, it's, they're not just beneficiaries. They're contributors to that entire pro process. I started uh, this interview with a question, and, and I want to end with the same question, uh, and it's your quote. Uh, Cancer feels like a punch that leaves you breathless. If you're successful, what will cancer be like in the future? It won't be that punch that leaves you breathless, will it? 
No, uh, yeah, I, no, it, w it won't. I think it will, you know, will always be, uh, you know, uh, a shock to a person's life. Your, ch your life, the day after you learn you're, you have cancer, is different from your life before that day. But I think the, the cancer, is, cancer is going to be a not nearly as big a deal in the future as it is now. Very much in the way that HIV, I think, you know, in the 1980s, it was absolutely a death sentence. Uh, now it's the kind of thing where, you know, you, you take the, this treatment and you tend to do really well. Cancer's headed that way. And, and so I think, you know, the, the, the main, I think, society's medicine's main problems 50 years ago, uh, from now, I'd venture, will, be, will not be cancer. It will be uh, the, you know, the next set of big problems. You may be the knockout punch for cancer. Well, At least you we're hope trying that. to do our part. Yeah. Yeah. It's great talking to you. Thanks no, so much. Thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot. Pleasure.